Um, also, on my behalf, welcome to the first seminar from Cancer.io. Uh, my name is Jeroen Powels, and I'm, as, as Heidi mentioned, I'm the uh, uh, research coordinator of the Cancer.io. And today I will be introducing different preclinical cancer models to you. Obviously, in 10 minutes, I cannot go into depth of, for any of these, but I hope that I will be able to, to introduce all of them or most of them uh, in very brief time, and then uh, that related the foundation for the discussion later, and also maybe might uh, make it easier to follow the other two talks. But before I go, in, go into the topic, I would like to first uh, briefly introduce Cancer.io. Heidi already said a few words. It's a business funded, business Finland funded uh, big consortium. Uh, it has two universities, many hospitals in Finland, uh, some small to mid-sized companies from Finland, uh, many uh, big pharma companies and, and some patient organizations. And we mainly focus on three teams, uh, IO Society, IO Research and IO Healthcare. Uh, from the University of Helsinki, we have the Klestrum lab where I'm working and the Mustjoki lab. And then Maya Holman is, is with us from the University of Turku. Um, that's all I want to say due to time restrictions, but, but please visit cancerio.org for more information. Uh, and also um, contact us for any information or if you would like to collaborate or something, uh, you can always reach us at cancerio-office at helsinki.fi. So the reason uh, why these preclinical models are so important is, as you're probably all aware, is that uh, most of the drugs that come out of preclinical development phase, they fail in clinical trials. This is especially bad in the oncology field where actually 95% of the drugs fails. This leads to uh, a tremendously high costs for drug development. So one drug costs over $2 billion to develop. And this again leads to increased drug prices for the consumer. I, I think that uh, Johanna will talk about this more a little bit in the next talk. And we feel that one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is that the preclinical testing phase uh, does not adequately predict drug efficacy for the patients. And uh, as you probably are aware of, there's many different uh, methods that are being used to test drugs uh, with different uh, uh, levels of, of complexity. Uh, and I will introduce several of these, uh, the ones shown here today. Uh, and I will start with cell lines, which are the easiest ones. Most of you will probably have worked with 2D cell lines, uh, which is the standard cell lines. They're easy, they're cheap, and they're fast, and they have a lot of other advantages, but we do know that they do not capture 3D biology. They do not represent tumor, the heterogeneous tumor environment. And most importantly, we know that drug responses in 2D do not or very seldomly reflect the response in patient tumors or tumors in patients. Um, some of these disadvantages have been uh, 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 circumvented by, by growing the cell lines in 3D. However, this is still not ideal and, and they still do not represent a the heterogeneous um, environment or capture the patient heterogeneity. One important uh, recent discovery and development is the organoid cultures. When I talk about organoids in this case, I'm really talking about the system developed and, and pioneered by Hans Klevers, but at the moment already used all over the world by hundreds, if not thousands of labs. So here you isolate a tissue from a patient or a healthy individual. You make single cells out of those. And then from the stem cells, organoids can grow out, which are like organ-like structures. Um, for example, there's mini guts that can be made out of those, and they uh, represent a 3D structure of the original uh, tumor or tissue, and they've also been shown to really quite well um, predict uh, drug responses. Uh, one big advantage of the organoids is that you can propagate them and you can create biobanks. And the, the, the paper you see on the left side is cell paper was uh, the first, to, to my knowledge, the first cancer, page, uh, cancer paper on these organoids, which was in colorectal cancer. This is still the poster child for uh, organoids, but many other tumors now have uh, uh, organoid biobanks and protocols. Also from metastasis, you can uh, develop uh, develop uh, organoids. And you can also do this from circulating tumor cells and many other um, uh, organoid uh, types uh, uh, are present. However, and, and these are really great system. However, they still do not represent the heterogeneous tumor microenvironment. And why do I keep banging out about, uh, about these um, 
about this tumor microenvironment? Well, the reason is, as you're probably all aware, a cancer is not just cancer cells, but it's comprised of a lot of different uh, cell types. Um, for example, cancer-associated fibroblasts, immune cells, and many others. And they are not just bystanders, these other cell types, but they very actively influence how the tumor develops, how fast it, they are involved in drug uh, resistance and many other things. One important um, uh, aspect to highlight here are the immune cells. The reason I want to highlight these is that because most of the drugs currently in development and in pipelines for, for uh, cancer are immune drugs uh, or immunotherapies, which means that they do not kill the cancer cells directly, but they try to wake up the immune system in the patient and have that attack the, the cancer. And uh, the big advantage of these immune therapies is that they can cure a patient rather than delay the inevitable uh, growth of the tumor. Uh, this happens only in a 10, 20 or 30% of the cases, but still it's, it's a huge step forward. Uh, and obviously to, to test uh, these immunotherapies, you need to have an immune component in your model system. For organoids, uh, because they derive from stem cells, cancer stem cells, they do not have an immune component, but, but there's a lot of developments ongoing here to, to implement uh, the immune system here. One of this is the where the organoids are grown together with lymphocytes from the tissue or from the blood, but we still feel that this is not the real uh, situation. Um, Another way to obviously uh, implement a uh, immune system or include an immune system is to use uh, whole um, organisms. And obviously mice are used a lot. And, and most of the drugs that are currently in clinical use have benefited tremendously from mouse models. Uh, there's uh, immune deficient mouse models where you uh, use human cell lines and inject them into the mouse. Uh, or you use these patient-derived xenografts, but as mentioned, these are immunodeficient mice, so you cannot really test immunotherapies here. The other option is to use mouse cell lines or then genetically engineered mouse models to develop tumors in the mice. And since these are mouse tumors in mouse, uh, they can be done in fully immune uh, competent mice, and you could use these to test immune drugs or immunotherapies. Uh, however, a running joke among health researchers is that everything has been cured in mice. This is not to say that, as I mentioned, mice have been extremely important in drug development up till now, but there are clear disadvantages. Um, they have a non-human context. Uh, most of the drugs developed uh, are being developed against human proteins, and they are not always recognizing the mouse proteins. Uh, the research mice are inbred, so they don't capture any genetic variation. Uh, some of them are immunodeficient. They are a high cost and slow. And most importantly, we know from experience that a lot of the drugs that work really effectively in, um, in mice, they simply do not work in humans. Some of them do, but, but a lot of them don't. And so the last model I want to uh, introduce is something that we have developed in the lab, but many other labs have done this as well. In fact, David Barbie's talk uh, um, soon will, will uh, focus on these as on something similar as well. Uh, so we call them the patient-derived explant cultures. So these are explants. So we do, uh, get tumors from the hospital uh, several times a week, and we um, uh, store part of them for biomarker analysis, but most of it is uh, incubated with collagenase, overnight. And what that results in is these small intact tumor fragments. So these are tumor cells and uh, immune cells and calves and all of that. Obviously, there's no circulation here. But other than that, uh, it's an authentic piece of tumor. We can uh, culture these in the, 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 the um, uh, slides that you see. And generally, we can get about 16 wells out of one tumor. And with several explants per well, we can then treat them with drugs and we can have many, many different endpoints here. So single cell sequencing, immunofluorescence, uh, and a lot of other things. And uh, Heidi Heikela, the, the host of today, uh, she published a paper in our lab in 2019 in Nature Communications. So check it out if you're interested. But there she could show that a certain drug combination uh, effectively kills make high breast cancer but not make low breast cancer or what we call healthy tissue, which is then either the, the adjacent tissue next to the tumor or then tissue that we obtain from reduction mammoplasties. 
Another project in the lab by Rita Turpin, who is uh, listening to this talk as well, uh, is that uh, do these PDEX now retain the immune contexture? And I will only show very few of her data here, but she could basically show that these immune cells are preserved after one week in culture. Um, the basal activity is also preserved. Uh, when we add immunocult, for example, to these uh, explants, we see that certain cytokines are being produced or uh, uh, produce more or produce less, uh, indicative of, of changes in the immune activity. And importantly, when we activate these, uh, or when we add immunocult, we see killing of the cancer cells, presumably by the T cells who are activated by the immunocult. And so uh, we are currently uh, using uh, uh, these explants with other more investigative drugs and to see can we model uh, their activity and can we learn new things from these drugs. So before I go to the final slide here on the acknowledgement, so this is all done in your classrooms lab in Helsinki. Um, uh, Paulina and Heidi are, are thanked because they are the godmothers of the uh, PDEX system or the explant cultures and Rita you see highlighted here is who did uh, all these experiments. The last slide I want to show is maybe a bit um, controversial, where I try to compare the different immune systems by giving simple pluses or minuses and, and uh, judging different aspects of them. And here, I don't want to say that one system is better than the other. But what I want to highlight here is that you probably need a combination of these model systems to truly um, uh, do correct uh, or good predictive uh, drug development. For example, if you look at the explants that I talked about last, they have very many advantages. They are low cost. They are very fast. We have the results in a week. The microenvironment is mimicked or is preserved, and we have full patient variation. But our disadvantage is that the throughput is quite low. We can only do 16 wells. Organoids, they can go very high throughput, but then they, they lose some of the microenvironment aspects. And, and all the other models, they have certain weaknesses and strengths. And so my, my, my basically take home message here is that, you know, we need to combine different model systems to do proper drug development. And with that, I would like to end my talk and give the microphone back to Haiti.